All right, welcome. Call the uh, regular meeting of the Creeks Restoration and Water Quality Improvement Citizens Advisory Committee to order. And we will start with roll call. Chair Hockman. Here. Jordan. Mr. Moldaver. Here. Mr. Schluter. Here. Mr. Weber. Mr. Wilson. Here. Ms. Longstreet. Here. And Ms. Falcone is not here yet, nor is Mr. Justice. All right, thank you. Um, moving on to item three, approval of the minutes from October 15th, 2008. Move approval uh, of the draft minutes of October 15th from the Casa Las Palmas meeting as submitted. Mr. Moldaver, is there a second? Second. Mr. Schluter, any further comments? Uh, all in favor? Any opposed? It's unanimous. Uh, Mr. Benson, are there any adjustments to our agenda? No. Lovely. Uh, moving on to item five, this would be the time that we take public comment in which any member of the public may address the committee for up to a minute on any subject within the jurisdiction of the committee that is not scheduled for public discussion before the committee. I have no speaker slips and we will move past public comment. Moving to item six, committee member and staff communications. I'm not aware of any communications from any committee members. Or is there anything from staff? No. Lovely. Uh, moving on to item seven, our manager's report. I believe we have something here. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just have a few items that I wanted to um, uh, inform the committee about. Uh, the first and maybe the most important one is that after five years of uh, coordinated effort among city staff and dozens of uh, over a dozen public meetings uh, reviewing and responding to comments from the public and other city departments uh, and the regional water quality control board we finally have a an approved stormwater management program for the city um, as you all probably remember the city council had directed st staff to move forward with implementation of the document so last year we actually began uh, the first year of implementation of what is a five-year program uh, but as of Wednesday of last week November 5th uh, the the program was officially approved by the regional water board and is now uh, being implemented as a regulatory document under the Federal Clean Water Act uh, we will uh, we will begin implementation immediately we do have some uh, a few additional uh, required adjustments that we need to make for the regional board those adjustments will be turned into them by January 5th and we will begin an annual reporting cycle so uh, March or excuse me April 1st 2010 will be our first annual report from the city to the regional board on the progress made on that program uh, so I wanted to to thank all the members of the public, all the different stakeholders we've worked with, all the different staff from city departments and divisions, and all of you, because I know this came to this committee several times over the last five years, and uh, it's a it's a very significant achievement for us. Um, I also wanted to to let you know something with regard to beach water uh, quality sampling. Uh, as of the end of October of this year, the county. Santa Barbara County who normally does the beach water testing for this area uh, stopped testing due to budgetary constraints uh, we have worked we as the city of Santa Barbara through the Creeks Division have worked with Santa Barbara Channel Keeper to fill that gap and the Creeks Division is now doing the weekly sampling of the four uh, main outfalls in the city limits so that's a Royal Borough Ledbetter East Beach at Mission Creek and East Beach at Sycamore Creek. Uh, Ch Santa Barbara Channel Keeper has uh, taken on the task of testing uh, other beaches on the south coast. So I think we've got from Gaviota to Rincon covered now. And we will test, the plan at this point is to test those beaches through uh, the end of March of 09 and uh, beginning April 1st the county is required by law to take up that that sampling again um, I think we'll have to see what happens with regard to funding for that program um, results from those tests by the way will be published every Wednesday in the Daily Sound and the Santa Barbara News Press 
as well as on the Channel Keeper website, which is sbck.org. Um, two, two more quick items. One is that last year we began doing annual creek cleanups that are very thorough cleanups where we work with a lot of community organizations and uh, creeks division staff, and we actually clean all the trash out of all of the major creeks in the city from the beaches all the way up to the mountains. Uh, this year, we did that over five days, literally wading through the, the pools that are, that are in the creeks and uh, removing over 6,000 pounds of trash from the creeks. Uh, the trash we removed includes plastic, glass, mattresses, shopping carts, televisions, bicycles, all kinds of things. Um, I wanted to thank the organizations that work with us this year on that, and that's the Community Environmental Council, Santa Barbara Channel Keeper, Santa Barbara Urban Creeks Council, and the Creeks Division staff uh, who also volunteered some time for that effort. And lastly, I want to thank uh, Marburg Industries because they provided us with dumpsters. We were actually filling up those large roll-off dumpsters from each creek, and they provided those to us free of charge for the effort. And then lastly, I wanted to make sure all of you had a chance to look at the proposed calendar for the Creeks Advisory Committee meetings next year. Um, we can discuss, discuss this at a future time. I just wanted to, to get it out in front of you early so we had time to uh, check everyone's calendar and make sure we're going to have a quorum at all of our meetings next year. And that's it, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Benson. Uh, I just really wanted to say congratulations to all staff, uh, present and past, for uh, the completion, or at least the, uh, the step that we've made on the stormwater management program. It's a great step for us. Thank you. Um, moving on. Uh, yes, Mr. Schluter. Uh, last month, Mr. Benson, we, uh, uh, you, you said that the uh, fence uh, was, was going to be completed uh, last week. Or Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, uh, Member Schluter. We're we're almost there. We've got some last some final tweaks that we're working on with the fence. Um, there's a there's a couple of places where it's still uh, fairly. Uh, it's not easy to climb over, but it's climbable, and we're working on some adjustments there. Uh, there, the manufacturer had to, or, or excuse me, the installer had to actually manufacture some of the fence parts along the freeway on-ramp to meet Caltrans specifications, which was something that we had uh, not planned for initially, but they were able to do, and, and so uh, those took a little bit longer than expected, but we're, we're, just about, uh, we're just about wrapped on that one. Thanks for asking. All right. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Wilson. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, Mr. Benson. Congratulations. What a quality stormwater management program. I'm just wondering if the regional board offered any substantive comments that were uh, particularly illusory and helpful for a Creeks division and city on the whole. Uh, I'll, I'll offer a general response to that, if that's okay. They, uh, the letter was very the letter we received from them was very formal and uh, contained, you know, deadlines and contained specific uh, requested changes that they still want us to make in the document. But um, we've worked very closely with their staff and with uh, um, board members and over the last five years, and I know that they appreciate that. Uh, we've we've ended up with a final product that is. Uh, that is really um, setting a bar high for other communities to try to reach. And uh, that is a, a direction that came from the City Council with regard to uh, the inclusion of pro projects uh, in, the, in the stormwater document so that we will have, um, because our water quality problems come from a lot of different sources with the non-point source type pollution, uh, the, the direction our, our program takes is to try to uh, prevent the solution, or excuse me, the pollution at the source and, and really improve water quality in the creeks and the beaches. So uh, the, the comments we've had from the regional board and their staff have been very positive. 
wouldn't be the uh, first time that this community has set the bar and the standards high. Congratulations. Thanks. All right, then. Um, moving on to item eight, subcommittee reports. Am I correct that there were no subcommittee meetings in the interim? Correct. All right, moving on now to the meat of our meeting. Item nine, business items, 9A. Water quality monitoring and research program fiscal year 2008 report. And we have Jill Murray to present. Mr. Benson, would you like to introduce this further? Or? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is an annual report that we provide to the committee. It's actually, I, I think Ms. Murray will, or Dr. Murray will um, describe that in just a moment, but it's, it's a summary or a condensed version of an annual report that we actually have available on the Creeks Division website at sbcreeks.com. Um, Dr. Murray is one of our water resources specialists in the Creek Division, and I think I'll turn it over to her to get to get started and provide the report. Thanks. Thanks, Cameron. Hi, everyone. It's good to be here again. It's been a while. Um, I'm, I know there's one new member, so I'll give a little bit of background on our water quality monitoring program, and then work through of the, uh, each of the main sections and just show some highlights. And I'll really be focusing on what's new because we really changed a lot in the last fiscal year, and I want to illustrate some of that. And as Cameron mentioned, this is all the entire report is available on the uh, our Creeks website, and a, the summary of the report, the highlights of the report, are in the staff report, so people can get that online as well. So our water quality monitoring program is designed to um, figure out exactly what our pollution problems are, what are our problem constituents. We compare those against known criteria to try and understand which would present a problem for aquatic organisms, which when and where we'd have a problem with human health. We're also always trying to assess our projects that we've put in and collect baseline data for future projects. And um, we're doing this in order so that we can plan better for the future and understand some of our projects we've considered pilot projects. Are those things we want to put in again? And if so, do we have the data to back that up? And then we also want to be able to provide the public with information about water quality. And the annual report, really the purpose of that is for us to document everything that we've done. There's a lot more background and a glossary in our five-year report. And so people can get that online as well. We have um, broken down our program just organizationally into our routine sampling, our storm monitoring, our project assessment, our microbial source tracking, biological assessment, and creek walks. And so um, I'll walk through each of those. But here's a, the map of all, most of our sampling spots. We've, we added a few in the last year. And they're centered around our projects. And I wanted to point out here we've got sites in um, storm drains and lagoons and uh, the ocean, the creek, and I wanted to point out for our four main watersheds, we have what we call an integrator site. So that's the site um, that would integrate water quality throughout the entire watershed. It's our, our lowermost site that's above tidal influence. So for Arroyo Borough, that's at Cliff Drive. For um, Mission, that is at Montecito Street. Laguna Channel, that's at Chase Palm Park. And Sycamore Creek, that's uh, right by the railroad bridge, very close to the zoo and 101. And we sample those those sites the most regularly. So on watershed assessment, we're designing our sampling to ask uh, answer the questions: What are the long-term trends in water quality? What are new hot spots of pollutants? What are new emerging constituents of concern? And then we've started addressing more: How are these contaminants getting to the creeks? Um, what are their routes? And what are their ultimate sources? And we're also um, tying our, our sampling in to try and understand beach warnings. And then two um, specific questions that we looked at in the last year were testing toxicity and trying to really understand if we have a problem with dissolved copper. And for the first time, we tested constituents in sediment. And um, the, there's a few things that we've done in the last year, and sediment is one, testing sediment, that were really done as, um, well, were really instigated by uh, concerns from the Creeks Advisory Committee. So we've really taken on some of that, especially our discussions and our subcommittee meetings have really fed into our, our research. So we've focused this year on getting staff training and tools to be able to measure flow um, almost every time we collect samples now. And that I'll show you how that adds to our ability to um, 
understand what's going on in the creeks. We improved our data management. We've got a good database now. It really helps us pull up data when we want to answer questions. Um, and again, the source is toxicity and sediment. So I want to stop for a moment. And some, for some of you, this is very clear. And some of you, you'll be hearing it for the first time. What do I mean when I say concentration versus load of a pollutant? The concentration, whether it's a dissolved metal, and you're thinking about the effect on steelhead or bacteria, and you're thinking about the effect on, on human health, um, those are like what the instantaneous concentration is. That's what the most like, that, that's how you would predict there being a toxicity problem. Or the more bacteria or the more viruses that are present, the more likely someone is to catch an illness at that moment. Um, for total, but it doesn't tell us, you know, we could compare concentrations. Sometimes we have the same concentration at Rattlesnake as we do at Montecito Street on Mission Creek, and we, yet we know those are very different situations because the flow at Montecito Street, or the flow at Rattlesnake is so small compared to the flow at Montecito Street. There's much more of the pollutant there at Montecito Street, and we quantify that by um, multiplying the concentration times the flow rate, and that gives us the total amount of pollutant moving through the creek at that moment. And so that we can then look at two different sites on a creek and uh, s subtract and get the difference. And then we know how much pollutant was actually coming in between those two sample points. And so that's what we've done. And that also helps people understand the impact on the ocean or comparing one storm to another. The concentration at one point in time doesn't really help you compare between two storms. But if you can say, um, if we're looking at long-term trends, much more came in in the past than in one storm than in another storm. So what we can do now is, and we've done this on a quarterly basis, and this is um, a really small subset of results, but I wanted to walk through it so you can, if you see it in the annual report, you'll understand it. We have um, measured the loads of the indicator bacteria and metals and some other compounds along the watersheds on a quarterly basis at about between five and eight sites on each watershed. This was one quarter when um, there wasn't flow at some of the spots. So we measure flow, this is Mission Creek, and on the upper pie chart you can see 5% uh, of the flow was coming from above Rattlesnake. 51% of the flow, or 44% of the flow was coming in from Old Mission Creek into Mission Creek. And then 51% of the flow came into the creek between the confluence with Old Mission Creek and Montecito Street. And then when we multiply that by our pollutant concentrations, we can see on the bottom the E. coli, about half of it came in from Old Mission Creek and half of it came in from the stretch in Mission Creek, uh, between Old Mission Creek and Montecito Street, so the, the lower urban reach. Whereas Enterococcus on that day looked really different. 97% of the Enterococcus bacteria uh, in, the, in the creek came in from Old Mission Creek. And so we have, um, we have one more quarter's worth of data before we're going to try and compile, uh, try and get some overall trends. But you can look at all the different pollutants that we've done this for and for the four different quarters and the four different creeks in the annual report. We also did toxicity testing um, for the first time. We did that for dry weather at all four integrator sites on each watershed and for four quarters. And we really have found that we don't have a chronic toxicity problem. This is toxicity is used to kind of integrate the effects of all potential pollutants. So instead of trying to separate it out by measuring concentrations, you're saying what's the impact on, in this case, they test it with fathead minnows. And we've had, this is percent survival um, of the fathead minnows over five days as they're exposed to the creek water. And you can see it's, it's almost always above 95%, which is a, the, similar to the control water. We were worried about dissolved copper because we have had exceedances of that, including in dry weather. And it's a common problem in other areas, but it's looking like, um, well, the EPA decided that it's not always creating a toxicity that they think it is. And so they've created a new model where you have to put in a bunch of different parameters to create the criteria for copper at specific sites. And so we've done that. And we didn't see any chronic toxicity. Uh, copper toxicity or any high concentrations. Our really hard water makes the copper a lot less bioavailable to steelhead and other aquatic organisms, so that's a good thing. Most sites um, were less than 25% of our calculated criteria for copper. And there was also a, a new concern in the Northwest that some very low copper concentrations can cause not, tox not toxicity in the standard way of measuring it, but 
neurological impairments, and our values are, are well below those levels. For the sediment testing, we did each um, of the lagoons by each integrator site and had very low, tox no toxicity. And we can't interpret all of our um, chemistry results yet because the state is still coming up with criteria to compare them against. For those that we have, that the state has available, most of, our com most of the sediment and for most of the compounds, it would be the same as a um, pristine site. So they call it, uh, the concentrations are considered reference. Uh, two exceptions were um, DDE and chloridane in Laguna. And those were, um, DDE was considered, the concentration was considered a low impact and chloridane it was considered moderate impact. So you would, uh, that means it would predict some moderate toxicity, which we didn't see though. But um, neither of those compounds are used anymore, but they're very long lived in the environment. So they're considered legacy pollutants. A new compound which has been detected in wetlands throughout Southern California, um, we tested for and did not find at all. So that's actually really good news. And we have, we condu have conducted one more round of sediment testing, and we, but we don't have the results yet. So we'll have those soon. For storm monitoring, we're, um, we always test the, our first flush, which is the first storm of the year, and we try and test it early in that first storm, which is supposed to have the highest concentrations of most pollutants, because you're, not yet you're getting everything off the roadways, but you're not yet diluting it with really high rainfall rates. And, um, we're, and now that we have um, some new equipment, we're also looking at the, our total amounts of pollutants discharged during a storm and variability during a storm. Also, we'll start looking more into sources and routes of pollutants to the creeks during storms. Still looking at toxicity and wet weather, and then also testing project performance. So in the last year, we put in our, uh, our flow gauge at Arroyo Burrow, which is great, and we have an auto sampler now, so we can um, set it up to collect, uh, you can program it in many different ways, but we'll set it up to collect several samples in the first 15 minutes of flow, and then we can combine those in one set of bottles and ship those off to be tested, and then we could collect samples, say, once an hour or every time a million gallons has gone by or something like that. So it's, this has really improved our um, methods. And for the first flush last year, we did toxicity, at really high tox, tox, uh, really high survival, really low toxicity at all of our site, integrator sites. We did one drain sample, and there was only 55% survival, so quite high toxicity um, in water that was in the Haley drain. So it wasn't in the creek yet, and we had no um, no exceedances for chemistry. I should say that we didn't actually test the Haley drain for all of the different chemical compounds, so we don't know what caused the toxicity there. Um, project assessment, we, um, as I mentioned, always looking at how, how to assess our projects, and we do this by collecting data pre-project and post-project, and then whenever possible, we're also collecting upstream and downstream data before and after the project, and that can really help us, to, you know, if, if we just collect the downstream data, we don't know whether there was a kind of a climatic improvement in water quality after a project went in or if it really had to do with the project. And so we try and really work through our statistical analyses before we design our monitoring. Uh, so for Mesa Creek, we have enough data now to show that um, this was the Mesa Creek Daylighting Project, which is part of the Arroyo Borough Estuary Project. And um, before construction, we would take samples um, at the top end of the culvert and the outfall of the culvert and indicator bacteria numbers didn't change from upstream to downstream, half the time they were lower downstream, half the time they were higher downstream. But since construction, 80% of the times we sample indicator bacteria numbers are lower on the downstream end. And it's an average reduction of 60% over only 300 feet of daylighting. So I think this is really neat for considering Mesa Creek as a, as a pilot project for daylighting, not just for us, but for other communities as well. We know that some of that is due to, we've tapped into more fresh water as we go downstream, so there's some dilution as we've restored hydrologic function we have some dilution but um, it's not enough to account for all of the reduction that we're seeing so there's probably some ultraviolet uh, inactivation of the bacteria there might be increased predation on the bacteria and adsorption to sediment and filtration through the sediment for our creek walks we um, are looking for long-term trends and then always trying to f identify new sources of pollution that we can observe coming into the creeks and then the last year specifically, we were looking at um, 
the cut, we had observed a lot lower trash in Mission, Lower Mission Creek, and we weren't sure if that was a result of uh, scouring by some big storms or not. And then we're also collecting baseline data for the installation of the catch basin screens. And this, in the last year, we did, um, instead of GPSing all of the trash, we said collect GPS, really highly quantitative data for all of the reaches of the creeks, and we decided to focus on um, picking up trash at the same time while recording all of any of the larger scale impairments that we could observe. And, but we're still on two stretches, still doing a quantitative assessment of trash. That's lower Mission Creek through the urban area, and that's just so we have one area where we are collecting quantitative data every year, and then also Old Mission Creek, again, to collect the baseline data for the catch basins inserts. Um, and there was twice as much trash in 07 as in 06, and that was actually pretty similar to what we saw this year. So we think that scouring in 05 really cleaned things out, and we, and we saw that when we sampled in 06. For our source tracking element, we are um, looking for locations in creeks and drains that do contain human waste that could be getting into the creeks and creating a true risk to human health, trying to find out where it comes from um, and what, what happens to the human waste signal as it moves downstream. Does it just become so diluted that it's not really going to present a problem to human health or do we just lose a signal? And, and then also what is the relationship um, between the, any human waste signal that we find and indicator bacteria and the beach warnings, if, if any. In the last year, we were mostly finalizing our, our grants that we have to focus on this, and it was finalizing our applications and our agreements and our contract, <coughs> excuse me, contracts. But we have conducted um, our sampling for our Laguna Watershed Study. We conducted that this summer, and this was really neat. We had automatic or we had flow gauges down in the storm drains and we could really see these patterns of pulses um, we had a, a couple different storm drains for two weeks each and then we're um, going to start sampling for our source tracking protocol development project soon and that one's really trying to get at we know there's human waste coming into a drain we've tried to find how it comes into the drain it's not as cut and dry as you would think and so we are working to try and develop methods to test uh, like, could sewers be leaking across into the storm drain and uh, things like that? And that, that's with UCSB. Uh, they'll, they're conducting the bulk of the work. So in our bioassessment, we work with a contractor, ecology consultants. This is another way of integrating water quality, and this integrates water quality and habitat quality and looks at what kinds of aquatic organisms are there in a highly polluted area. You would expect to see really tolerant organisms in a pristine area, you would see more sensitive organisms. And then you plug all those results into what they call an index of biological integrity, and then you can rank different sites in different years. And things really went down in, in 2007 in terms of, uh, so we'd say they were, they were, there was poor biological integrity, and the consultant interprets that that was really from having such a dry year and such a lack of scouring rainfall to get all the fine sediment out. And um, I think that has been similar to what we see. We just got results from 08, and it's pretty similar. Things haven't really bounced back yet, even though we did have that one really good storm. So these are some general recommendations for 09. I think our program will stay largely the same. Uh, we're going to focus the quarterly sampling when the load stuff down into more, um, some of where we know we had some problem reaches focus there. We're, the toxicity testing is very expensive, and I think we've answered our dry weather question, and we've answered the questions about copper for dry weather, so we'll shift the budget to something else. As Cameron mentioned, we're taking on some more beach monitoring. Um, our storm monitoring, now that we've done our first flush sampling, we'll focus on using the auto sampler and flow gauge out of Rio Borough. We've got a lot of work to do with our, our um, research grants. And we also are going to be looking into dissolved oxygen and eutrophication problems specifically as it would relate to steelhead restoration, so some of the pools around the channel. And, um, and really think about, there's a lot more information now about the beach warnings and indicator bacteria, and so it's time to really revisit and, and focus on des designing a study to test some of the hypotheses that have come up. We've got some data from Santa Cruz that showed indicator bacteria were growing on kelp really fast, especially in, in warm temperatures. Could that be, could there be enough of that to actually cause beach warnings? That's the, we don't, we don't have an answer to that yet. Do we have 
some hypotheses about um, more beach warnings after there's a lot of dogs on the beach, for example. Well, we probably, if we looked at our data the right way, could we, there's so much data now, we could probably answer some of those questions. So we'll be um, working on that. So the next steps are just to keep we'll keep going with our uh, research plan for FY09, carry out all of our scheduled sampling. We're now reporting on a quarterly and annual basis. Um, so far, we haven't been publishing the quarterly reports. Uh, but if anyone wants that information, they would be welcome to get it from us. We've been waiting until we have everything on an annual basis to put it on the web. And again, working on our source tracking projects. And then you should see um, some information about our L Laguna Watershed Study in April 09. That should be done. And um, the, the, we'll wait until we have results from the source tracking protocol development project. So that will be um, at the end of next summer, so around November 2000. Oh. That could either say 09 or, that should say 09. Sorry about that. And, and I'll take questions. All right. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Uh, the first thing I'll ask is if there's any public comment on this issue. Okay. Seeing none, I'll take comments and questions from the committee. Mr. Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Dr. Murray. Very uh, well put together presentation and report. I had a question regarding the uh, uh, stopping the toxicity testing and the sediment testing. The uh, one chemical species you mentioned was the pyrethroids, pyrethroids? Um, I didn't mean to say that we would stop sediment testing okay. or toxicity in sediment because we've only, we don't have very many of those samples yet. Right. So just the water samples. Okay. And we okay, I thought just a couple minutes ago you'd mentioned that um, those funds would be diverted elsewhere and I just wanted to talk about that a little okay. bit. Okay, let me, so, so that I can be clear, and then we can talk about it. I meant um, for our quarterly water testing at the integrator sites to not test for toxicity, because we've done that at each of those sites four times. I think we've had really consistent results, nothing variable. Um, sediment testing, we've only, we do it once a year, and we've, so we've done each site um, twice, and you've only seen results for one site. We don't even have the results for the second site, or you only have results for one year and we are still waiting for our results for our second year. And we do toxicity and chemistry, including pyrethroids on the sediments, and I don't want to change that now. That's, are you clear? And when does that once a year sediment testing occur? Uh, before, end of summer, before rains. So we did it in, um, I think we did it in sept early September this year. Uh, pyrethroids are herbicide or insecticide? Um, Insecticide, I believe. Insecticide. Yeah, yeah, because it comes from chrysanthemums. I thought it's used for ants and other things, but it just my my thought, generally speaking, is obviously timing of testing might uh, be relevant in regards to application of the chemical and its you know resilience and resistance, fate and transport in the environment, and if. Um, it, it may be totally appropriate. I'm just asking the question, you know, certainly if um, that's, that's you know, a good we're point. looking at various chemical species and, you know, their degradation byproducts, if they really are, if it's the right time of year to test, particularly if it's happening once a year. People, well, the reason, it's not found in water generally. So we've, we've followed the lead of SCORP and their testing protocol. And they were really focusing mostly on sediments because that's where it has actually been found. So the sediments supposedly should where it accumulates and it shouldn't matter exactly when you test, but they have also tested, I'm pretty sure, uh, late summer. Thanks. The most, the most deposition before things get scoured out. Makes sense. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Mr. Schluter. My, my principal question um, is concerned with the, um, the study to test hypotheses about beach uh, about, uh, yeah, about beach warnings. And my concern is that you went through some of your hypotheses really fast and I'm not sure I caught them. So could you go back over and, and review what, what alternative hypotheses you have about those? Yes, I can. You're, um, so I normally talk about indicator bacteria and all the issues surrounding them when I do a talk. And I didn't do that this time. It's you're the only person who hasn't heard about it many, many times. Um, so it's, this could be a, a long talk. 
uh, but I can just list the hypothesis. No, they haven't heard that. So I can just list the hypotheses, <laughs> but to listen to you just it's complicated. Right so um, one hypothesis, hypothesis would be that indicator bacteria are truly indicative of sewage. And uh, the indicator that we, bacteria that we see here um, behave very similarly in predicting human health problems as they have in other areas with known sewage discharges. Um, the other, and I think that Southern California research is pretty well discounting that hypothesis. Well, what? Discounting it, Discount. disproving it, yeah. Because there's, it's been shown that um, the indicator bacteria can uh, grow in the environment and survive for a long time in the environment. And when they've tried, when people have tried to correlate indicator bacteria with um, other signs of human uh, sewage, like viruses, they don't necessarily correlate. Um, so, so one hypothesis would be that the indicator bacteria are maybe coming from human waste, but surviving in the environment and persisting and um, causing beach warnings. Another would be that they're actually growing in the beach environment, and that could be in sediment and in kelp and in warm estuary water that it becomes somewhat intestine-like over the summer, and that is getting into the ocean water and leading to beach warnings. Um, another, and some of these hypotheses interact, but one could be, and this was uh, someone at um, the county's environmental health services hypothesis, is that on beaches where you have both a lot of kelp and a lot of dogs, you get dog waste inoculating kelp, and then those indicator bacteria are growing and causing beach warnings. And, um, and sort of a, a variation of that is that you would then predict higher beach warnings on weekends when there are a lot more dogs and visitors. The problems are those co-vary with um, warm temperatures, which could lead to more, more rapid in situ uh, growth of indicator bacteria. So I know I'm giving you a really um, brief answer to a, a pretty complex issue. Is that satisfactory? Uh, I, yes, that, that's helpful. I, my, I guess my concern is that these are really broad questions. And I would assume that there's a lot of work going on in these kinds of questions all along the California coast, yes. if, not, if not elsewhere. So the question is, I guess, really directed toward funding. Why should the Measure B funds be devoted for this kind of study when presumably some of these kinds of, of um, results are going to come from broader studies uh, conducted by universities or larger entities than simply the Santa Barbara County or, or Santa Barbara City for that matter? Well, um, so the, what we have on our list here is just to design a study, not to carry it out. What would we need to be able to do? To, we, we bat around a lot of these ideas. What would we actually need to do to answer them and which things have are actually being addressed? We have. Our, we definitely have our fingers on the pulse of what other research groups are doing. Um, and then that also sets that we do uh, work with people at UCSB and people at other um, research areas. And there is additional research. We would never be able to carry out a large scale study with Measure B money. That would never be appropriate. But there is additional um, research money available with Proposition 84. And so they're soliciting grants. And so we might just be a, it's really advantageous to us when we partner with an academic researcher who then uses our area as their, um, the geographic scope for their research. And that's probably what would happen if we designed anything more than um, let's collect a few additional extra indicator bacteria samples. Great, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Moldaver. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Murray, for a very fascinating update. Uh, I was thinking as you were reporting that some of the stuff where you tested for four consecutive quarters and hadn't found anything, that some of those things with the concurrence of the staff and the work program, you might want to consider moving to maybe every second or third year just to make sure that the recent thing is uh, typical of a trend and do some spot retesting later. Uh, I wasn't surprised you didn't detect serious amounts of copper because until uh, the bottom fell out of the commodities market a couple of months ago, uh, the black market on copper was so hot that uh, I couldn't imagine any source of copper not being diverted uh, to China and um, uh, to other places. But I, I would also think that um, the information that you've assembled so far 
uh, number one, next April, when you've been able to do the uh, next study increment, that might be a great time uh, for you and Mr. Benson to uh, consider doing a presentation to the Greater Santa Barbara well, Lodging and Restaurant Association because, uh, as you know, Mr. Benson did an excellent presentation a couple of months ago, but they often ask, and some of their guests ask, um, where does uh, the Measure B money go for and what knowledge are we getting about cleaning up the beaches? And in that same sense, of course, uh, as you well know, Dave Parker and Eric Zimmerman are always looking for uh, challenging projects uh, for interns who could either do graduate dissertations or senior honors papers. Uh, so when you've got uh, uh, tons of data uh, and, and there's just one of you and you've got a lot of projects uh, to shuffle, uh, it might be an opportunity um, to uh, see if uh, people will be willing to come in and help you go through some of the data in, in exchange for some academic credit. And it would, it would speed up the processing and uh, have even better reports in the future. And I, 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 would, I would say to my friend Mr. Schluter not to uh, in any way apologize for any of these questions about the indicator bacteria because you're not only educating yourself and the committee, but uh, anyone at home who's watching this updated report, we never know who might be seeing it for the first time. And if there's one person who asks in public, there's probably 20 more who are thinking the same thing. And so Dr. Murray's able to reach all of them um, you know, with one set of answers. So thank you again for a good report. Oh, you're welcome, and thanks for the suge suggestions about the interns. And most summers we do hire at least one water quality intern, and we have had their assistance with data um, analysis. But I'll, I'll please send me an email with those specific contacts. I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Wonderful. I think Mr. Wilson, you had a follow-up question. Okay, uh, Dr. Murray, hopefully in maybe just a couple sentences, really briefly, could you just give us a quick update as to what is the current state of knowledge in Dr. Holden's UCSB's uh, microbial source tracking as relation to if it, you know, when does it look like we might be able to start using, maybe we already are, some of that information and these questions about source bacteria, indicator bacteria and kelp and dogs and seagulls and the like. If that's in one or two sentences, probably not, but I'll try. Um, we have used her, we have already used her re results. Uh, we don't, it hasn't led to um, an off-the-shelf sample analysis that anyone could run for a few hundred dollars, for example. It, we still are working with her on, her on a research basis, but it's definitely, um, the results that we've gotten from the research there have definitely led to our sort of strategic decision to focus on human waste and not so much on trying to identify seagull versus raccoon versus dog because we have looked into the human health risks and they're much higher for untreated human waste than they are for dog or seagull or raccoon waste. And um, those are, so we, so already we've, we've strategically decided that's the, the way we're going to focus, and we've communicated that with the state and who's funding the Clean Beaches Initiative. And so it's affect, it affected our design of our Laguna watershed study, for example. We have talked for a long time about putting an ozone disinfection facility um, there, and we're now not doing that without conducting uh, source tracking work to confirm or figure out if there is human waste there, and um, if so, which, at least which portion of the watershed is it coming from. Um, So was that satisfactory for you? Yeah, as, uh, in relation to indicator bacteria, um, oh. and beach closures and the like, are we getting closer to having some more so far, information um, So far when she compiles all of her results from all the different drains, creeks, and beaches that we've tested, it, they, the results don't correlate very high, very well at all with indicator bacteria concentrations. However, you don't generally find any positive signs of the human waste DNA, DNA markers where you don't also have at least a history of fairly high indicator bacteria numbers. Caveat to that is you pretty much find high indicator bacteria numbers in most storm drains when you have kind of regular summer flow. They're, they seem to be pretty much everywhere. And we've, in the Laguna watershed study, so one of our um, highest indicator bacteria concentrations came, I'm, um, 
very, uh, my hunch is that it really was from decaying grass clippings that were getting into the storm drain and growth, bacterial growth on those. Thanks for your update. Okay. All right, Mr. Schluter, a follow up? Uh, one of the things that you just said uh, prompts this question. In your uh, indicators, can you differentiate between canine and human waste? With the standard indicator bacteria test by which all beach warnings are decided on, absolutely not. There's three groups of indicator bacteria that are tested, total coliform, E. coli, and enterococcus, and all warm-blooded warm animals and some cold-blooded have all of those. Okay. Um, we usually don't take public comment questions, but I think we'll do so today. I have a slip from Kira Redman who says she has a question. need to press anything. Um, I'm concerned about what the motivation might be behind doing a study to find potentially alternative sources of bacteria that are causing beach warnings. Um, I frankly don't think the public is going to care whether it's from decaying kelp or dog poop or human waste that there is a link between indicator bacteria and human health problems and I'm not exactly sure I think it needs to be spelled out very clearly what your intent is in conducting such a study before public money is spent on that. So maybe you could elaborate a little bit on what the sort of purpose of doing such a study might be. Our purpose is to provide the public with the best information about protecting human health. And um, when epidemiology studies have been conducted where the indicator bacteria are coming from a sewage treatment plant, for example, or anything with a suspected connection to sewage, there is a connection between, correlation between, not always good, but some correlation between indicator bacteria and illnesses. And the um, Mission, Mission Bay in San Diego, there was a very large epidemiology study conducted and indicator bacteria didn't correlate with um, human illness at all. And it was determined that that was because the indicator bacteria were largely coming from seagulls and there really aren't uh, like GI bugs that are exchanged between bacteria, I mean between um, seagulls and humans. And so for us, we really want to differentiate. We, ha we have a set amount of money or there, you know, th there's a set amount of resources. We want to get rid of the problems that could be causing human health risks. And generally that's going to be a short-lived GI bug but there's the potential for something more serious, and we don't want to knowingly be putting that into the creeks and ocean. And so we don't want to have kind of a, a blanket, uh, kind of flat rate approach of putting our resources towards eliminating indicator bacteria problems throughout the city without prioritizing which of those may be coming from something that has nothing to do with human health problems and something that does. Thank you. I have a couple of comments and okay. I'll, I'll start with this issue, which is that I'm actually very much in favor in finding alternative hypotheses because we've known uh, from the beginning of our work here at the Creeks Division that between the, uh, the lack of, or at least the question to the link between these pathogens and uh, the indicator bacteria and human illness, but also the time delay between when the samples are taken and when the information is available, uh, whether or not the actual test that's used indicates a link to human illness. Uh, I'm very much in favor of anything that gets us further in the direction of more precise tests with a, with a particular goal, which is increasing uh, human health and preventing human illness at our beaches. Um, I'd also like to go back to the um, uh, assessments on the restorations uh, that we've done, and I was very interested in the results on our uh, daylighting. Uh, uh, what is it, Mesa Creek? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's great. It seemed to be a very straight. That piece of the puzzle was a fairly straightforward decision. It had great results. I'm wondering if there are other places in the city where we might think about applying that uh, very simple fix. Uh, it's, it's just a, a question. But I'm also noticing in this report um, 
a lack of information about, for instance, Bonnet Park, uh, that restoration. I'm wondering if we have any information about that, our first restoration, as to how successful it may or may not have been. And one final question in that same paragraph, you talked about the west side drain, and then you put this sentence, indicator bacteria results return to background levels relatively quickly downstream. I'm just not familiar with the term uh, background levels. Uh, so could you tell me what that means? Sure, well, that, there is not a, a technical definition of that term. Um, in the annual report, there is a, a large section devoted to results from um, the west side drain uh, the, and the, the surf project, the UV disinfection project. And ever since that's gone in, we can't really separate effects of Bonet versus the restoration versus the effects of the UV. So, um, and Bonet was much, uh, designed much more towards habitat restoration than water quality. But we and we ha so um, we haven't um, and we haven't compiled all of our results from Bonet. When we have done preliminary assessment, we're not seeing um, from just the restoration a change in downstream bacteria concentrations. That was a project that where the monitoring wasn't designed to test upstream and downstream, and it, it, it's too bad. It, probably should have been. Um, for the SURF project, I can just give you a summary. It's highly effective. It's a very effective facility. It, indicator bacteria numbers go to zero coming out of that facility. And then by west, by the West Andam Pamu Bridge, which is basically the downstream end of the park, they're back to the levels that they were um, before the project or what they are to typical creek values, which are highly erratic, high numbers. Okay, well, that, that's what I feared the answer was, but Yeah, all right, so we have, um, and that's typical of UV disinfection projects. Uh, the one at Moonlight Beach in Encinitas is, you can see the beach from the project, and it hasn't, it's definitely improved hum human health. I mean, that water is cleaner, and, and, but as far as beach warnings, it hasn't changed things. So it, I think people really have to decide, is it indicator bacteria beach warnings that they're going after, or is it true water quality improvement? Because the um, implementation plan could be different. There are some some um, some of the TMDL implementation plans that we've seen suggest things like shooting guns to pop guns to scare away the birds, or putting steam cleaning sediment. But that's not really going to do anything for human health. All right. Thank you very much. Yeah. Seeing no further comments. We'll move to our next item, which is 8B, our fiscal year 2008 year-end budget report. We have Mr. Benson presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, the purpose of this item is to provide the committee with a summary report of fiscal year 2008 revenues and expenditures. Um, as you all know, the city operates on a, uh, on a fiscal year that runs from July 1st through June 30th. So this report is for uh, July 1st, 2007 through June 30th, 2008. Um, as I go, I'm going to try to go through this quickly so we have time for discussion at the end, but I also wanted to make sure that uh, all the committee members were familiar with the, the terms we use when we're talking about the budget, so I'll, I'll try to explain those as we, as we move through, okay? Um, I'm going to begin with the FY08 revenue picture. We did see a slight increase in Measure B revenue compared to the previous year but the increase was lower than the original projection. Uh, however, our other income was higher uh, in FY 2008 than we originally projected, so our, so our total revenues for FY 08 were just slightly higher, about $12,000 higher than the uh, budget projection. And we also had some additional funds that were carried over from FY 07. And this is one of the terms that I wanted to, to explain. When it says up there that there were encumbered funds left unspent for, from FY07 year end, 
what that means is in our operating budget, we had contracted to have some work performed. For example, uh, we had a, a purchase order open and had contracted to run uh, public service announcements on Cox cable. And we hadn't run all of the uh, all of the ads in the contract yet, so there were funds remaining in that contract that we had promised to pay to someone, but that we hadn't spent yet. And so those funds in our operating budget roll over into the, the following year. So we had, for uh, FY08, we had approximately $231,000 in uh, encumbered operating funds that rolled over into FYOA and about $2.6 million in capital funds. And now I wanted to take a look at our expenditures. We had a, uh, a total amended budget of $2.9 million. Now, <laughs> this is another term to explain. The amended budget is what happens, we have, a, we have an original budget that the council reviews and adopts, and then when those funds roll over from the prior year's operating budget into the adopted budget, that becomes your amended budget. So that's your, that ends up being the actual amount of funds you, you have in that, year's, uh, that fiscal year's budget. Uh, so our amended budget was 2.9 million. Our actual expenditures were about 2.3 million. Uh, so we had almost $200,000 remaining encumbered. Um, our, our total funds expended and encumbered were approximately $2.5 million, which was 84% of our amended budget, which means the, the other 16% of that, $477,000, goes into the unappropriated reserve account. And the unappropriated reserves means that council has not directed us to use that funds for anything in particular. In this slide, we break our expenditures down by category. And uh, we have, we've divided them into six different categories. We have salaries and benefit, and that's our permanent and hourly staff. Uh, that includes uh, eight full-time equivalent staff. Uh, it includes interns. It includes the youth apprentice program that we, that we operate during the summer or, or that we participate in during the summer, excuse me. The supplies and professional services line includes all kinds of supplies from pens and staples uh, to mutt mitts and all of our professional services, including the water quality research and creek cleanup contracts. Uh, a wide range of professional services. Our allocated costs are things like our IS, our vehicle maintenance, vehicle replacement, phones, that kind of thing. Our special projects and transfers, the, the majority of the special project line, I, uh, our component of our budget is for the street sweeping program. And then uh, our capital program we, we transfer funds each, each budget year out of our operating budget and into our capital program for, specific, for use on specific capital projects. And then that 1% number, uh, equipment and fixed assets, that's um, uh, depreciation and, and uh, small fixed assets. And here we break down our expenditures by program area, and by now you're all familiar with our with our main program areas: water quality improvement, creek restoration, and community outreach and education. Uh, as you can see, the bulk of our budget is for water quality improvement, with the remainder divided among community outreach and creek restoration. And what you see there is 55% water quality improvement, 22% community outreach, 22% creek restorations. It's pretty close along the lines of the uh, recommended proportion from, from this committee, uh, which recommended approximately 50% of the funds be used for water quality and 25% each for the other two categories. Those numbers do change from year to year, depending on, uh, primarily depending on capital projects and which project is actually being, being constructed that year. Uh, 
Um, I, I wanted to break down each of those categories a little bit also. So this, I'll start with the water quality improvement uh, category. And <clears throat> the total amount spent in this category is just under $100,000 for FY08. As you can see, we had some of the DNA-based microbial source tracking research. That was really um, the tail end of the uh, DNA-based research that we were performing the prior fiscal year and part of uh, the presentation you received last summer from Dr. Holden at UCSB. The watershed project and storm sampling is what we just heard about. Uh, that includes the routine watershed assessment, our restoration uh, sampling, water quality treatment, and our storm event sampling. And then lastly, we do habitat assessment each year. Some of this is um, uh, benth uh, benthic macroinvertebrate samples. Some of it is uh, creek bed analysis, riparian habitat, and uh, that's all field analysis that we can compare to year to year to, to continue to determine the health of our, of our creek environments. In the community information and outreach category, uh, particularly through the media, the total amount spent in FY08 was uh, approximately $135,000. That's largely divided uh, in, la in the last fiscal year. It's, it's uh, a little more even than it has been in the past. Usually our television advertising budget's been higher. Uh, we've, we've had success with all three types of of media, so we're trying to use all, all three. Uh, we have significant contracts, uh, bilingual contracts in both, in, in all three categories, excuse me. Um, one thing I wanted to say primarily with our television advertising is that both Cox and Univision, uh, who we advertise with, match our purchases because it's a, a public service. Um, they match our, our uh, contracts on a one-to-one -one basis for every ad we place, they'll run it again for free. And with our creek restoration program, our total amount spent for, for FYOA was approximately $85,000. The, the large component of that is, is uh, maintenance of our restoration site. And as we continue to do more restoration, that continues to grow but we do see that it tapers off after a number of years. Generally speaking, uh, five years of hard work and um, concentrated attention and, and maintenance on a site will we'll put it in a, a good condition. We still have to keep an eye on it, but we see the maintenance costs go down at that point. The restoration site maintenance includes our creek steward projects at Stevens Park uh, over by Cacique Street Vernon Road, Bonnet Park, uh, and then we talk about our project monitoring. We do uh, an extensive amount of work still over at Royal Borough Estuary and Mesa Creek project, although we've, we think we've got all the plants we need in the ground there, so now it's just ongoing maintenance, uh, but, the, but the maintenance will continue to become less and less over time. And then with regard to our capital program, in FY08, we transferred approximately $635,000 from our operating budget into our capital program. Uh, you see on the screen a list of the projects that we uh, provided some funding for in FY08. La at our last meeting, we discussed the future six-year capital improvement program. All of these projects had been on past capital programs, and we discussed them in our, in our capital improvement workshop meeting. Um, I don't, in the interest of time, and because we just did, we went through these last month, I don't want to go through each of the projects, uh, but I will say that uh, most of those projects are, are moving forward right now, and the only exception, exception to that that I see is the Old Mission Creek at West Figueroa Stormwater Management Project. And as, as we've discussed in the past, the, the staff and the committee uh, decided to put that on hold temporarily because some of the techniques used in that project are similar to the ones we're using on the golf course. And we want to implement them on the golf course, 
we want to gain the experience from that project and we also want to examine the results and assess the results a little bit before moving forward with what will be a slightly more complicated and expensive project. And then ending uh, FY08, we had an unappropriated reserve balance of about $4.8 million. And that number is, is inching up every year. Uh, I think when I gave this report last year, we were at four million or, or just over four million dollars. I did want to remind the committee, and we've discussed this on, on many occasions. We do have the project at the golf course, the stormwater uh, project at the golf course, that uh, we will be going to council with in the spring. Uh, that we are intending to use uh, some of this reserve fund for, and then. As we discussed last month with our six-year capital program, we have projected out over the next six years that we will be drawing down the uh, unappropriated or the reserve over the next six years to a point that it is close to what this committee had recommended us maintaining as a reserve, which is something in the in the ballpark of two and a half to three million dollars. And with that, I will conclude, and I'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, thank you, Mr. Benson. Do we have comments? Let's start at this side. <coughs> your questions, Mr. Mulder. Uh, very good report, uh, Cameron. Uh, as a member of the uh, budget subcommittee, I think I've heard you talk about this before. But uh, again, with the venue of uh, TV in this large. Uh, uh, audience teaming in the room. Uh, it, it's always good to review, uh, especially with uh, tough times, where the money's coming from and going to. Mm -hmm. Given the severity of the national recession, which is going to affect um, federal as well as foundation grants for the next couple of years, and the severity of the state's shortfalls, which are uh, much, much worse than uh, we've been led to believe before the election, do you think that our ability to leverage uh, matching funds on this budget in the coming year uh, is going to be impacted beyond what you'd uh, forecast earlier? Thank you, Mr. Moldaver. Uh, I think it's yet to be seen what will happen with the availability of grant funds in the, in the short term, uh, meaning over the next two years or so. Uh, there's still a significant amount of grant funding available. We are uh, we're actually in anticipation that those funds will not be around forever. We're making an extra effort now to to leverage the resources we do have and uh, and work to to obtain every single grant that we possibly can. Uh, there are some bond measures that were passed over the last several years, including Proposition 84, and we will be, uh, we have and we will continue to apply for that funding as it's, as it's released. Uh, there are still grant funds uh, being made available at the federal level, particularly for endangered species recovery, steelhead recovery in particular, and we will continue to uh, to try to obtain those funds. We've been very successful uh, with with that program, obtaining grant funding. And lastly, we're working with uh, a number of community groups in Santa Barbara uh, who have access to private foundation funding that, that we may not if we were not partnered with them. And uh, they are, we're working collaboratively on several of these projects and, and some of those funding, uh, some of those funding sources have seen a uh, reduction in the funds that they have available to disperse, but others are, are still healthy and, uh, and are still providing grants to community organizations. I, I did want to say one thing. I didn't, I didn't say anything about grants in this presentation. We did, have, we did have revenues from the prior fiscal year's grants come in in FY08, but they weren't new grants, so I didn't include them, include them in, this, uh, in this presentation. The amount of those revenues coming in was approximately four hundred thousand dollars. We had no new grants come in in, in FY08, um, but that seems to be the nature of the grant cycles. In the first quarter of FY09, we've had close to nine hundred thousand dollars in grants come in. So, uh, so 
they go they do go up and down and we don't really have control over when the grants are awarded but we do apply for everything we can mm -hmm. um, I, I was just going to follow up briefly my, my thought is the foundations that are giving the grants are deriving their income from investment portfolios and now that many of those portfolios have lost 50 percent of their value uh, from uh, 10 or 15 months ago uh, unless there's a tremendous uh, recovery in the very near future uh, the grant making cycles they're going to have a lot less to give and similarly because of the severity of the state and federal economic problems although technically money was approved by the voters for bonds um, it wouldn't surprise me as has happened so often in the past that either the governor or the feds will embargo those funds uh, or use them uh, as uh, chips on the table uh, until structural solutions uh, are, are, are coming forward. And uh, so, so sometimes it might go the way you're talking about because if uh, giving bond money will lead to contracts or will lead to employment or capital improvements, that might put you know more jobs into the economy. They might let it flow. On the other hand, like in the state where they're constitutionally required to at least try to balance their budget and the shortfall uh, goes from here to Rhode Island this year. Um, it, I, I think it would be problematical uh, to uh, count on uh, the availability of some of those bond monies. Um, uh. All right, thank you. Mr. Schluter? Just a brief comment that I appreciated the clarification of terms. It helps understand your presentation. Mr. Wilson? Thank you. Mr. Benson? <clears throat> Any thought as to how Creek's division may, from a budgetary perspective, get involved in what may actually turn out to be some implementation and moving forward in the Lower Mission Creek uh, project that has been languishing in some state or another for 30 or odd years? Looks like actually inertia may start to be overcome and I'm wondering to what extent Creek's division from a fiduciary perspective may be getting involved in that. Thank you, Mr. Wilson. The, the project on Lower Mission Creek that I think you're referencing is is the what's known as the Lower Mission Creek Flood Control Project. And uh, from what I can tell studying the history of that project, it's been on the books since the 1960s. And so we've had almost 40 years of planning for that project, and and I think you're you're right. I know you serve on a task force um, that that reviews design for that project. It does have more inertia than I think it's had in 40 years. So that's saying something um, in regard to our involvement financially with that project. We have had uh, we've had some design oversight, but it is a flood control project. It's being managed by the uh, flood Control District and the City Public Works Department in conjunction with the Army Corps of Engineers. So we're we're working on design to try to improve the water quality and habitat aspects of that project. Uh, we did assist with um, something called the Inter uh, Interregional Water Management Plan or program that the county has adopted, and we participated in that and we supported the city's projects, including the uh, Lower Mission Creek Flood Control Project, which did get funding through Prop 50 that was most recently dis dispersed uh, to the tune of a million dollars. And we assisted with that, but in the process, we also uh, we also successfully added several Creeks Division capital projects to, the, to that plan, which makes them now eligible for the additional bond funding, uh, along with other city projects. To the extent that we're reaching backwards in history to describe some projects. Uh, I think that's on topic, but in terms of looking forward as to what we can do in the future, that's not part of our discussion for this agenda item. So I'm going to cut that part short right now. Uh, did you have any further questions, Mr. Wilson? Nothing that's going to. I had a, a question, and I think I answered it myself doing a little math, but I want to make sure that I understand. I'm looking at the um, one page. Um, list of expenditures, uh, revenues and expenditures that is on legal size paper in our packet. 
and I'm looking at the column labeled amount expended, and I'm trying to reconcile the numbers that I'm seeing here to the pie charts that you presented with regard to the different uh, programs. Uh, you know, that we had uh, approximately, what was it, 54 percent water quality and 22 percent or so in each of restoration and uh, community outreach. And I was trying to figure out why the numbers in your next pie charts were so low and how those could make up those percentages. And I'm guessing that you did not include certainly any of the below the line items such as the um, special allocations and the capital program. But you were not also um, including any of the salaries and benefits in that calculation as well. Is that correct? Overall, my, my belief is that overall the Creeks Committee was hoping to attain some sort of balance overall in the budget, at least with the, the non, you know, the above the line items um, of that 50, 25, 25 split. So I would be interested in at least understanding that the salaries and benefits are being allocated along similar lines or some of them are being allocated out to uh, you know things that don't enter into that calculation but when you look at I think you said something like water quality improvement was I forget the number but it was less than 150,000 something like that as part of the budget well that's certainly nowhere near 50 percent of our you know, total of 2.3 million expended, nor is it near 50% of the 1.46 that's the above the line expenditure. So at some point I'd be interested in seeing, you know, how that works out if there's a way. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll, I'll just respond quickly to that. Yes, uh, you're correct. I, I took the, the actual expenditures from those thing, those uh, line items out of the budget and, and put them in the presentation. Part of that was to to be clear about what those things were in those different categories and what we were using in those different categories. Uh, and part of it was to uh, shorten the length of the presentation. Certainly. In the staff report that I prepared that is that that went out to the committee and also is available to the public. Did it I gets into more it? detail and it actually has the full number and the breakdowns with the, with the salaries and benefits and everything everything included. Uh, the percentage breakdowns don't change. Um, they, they stay almost almost exactly the same and uh, but it does have the larger numbers that will add up to the total you're looking well, for. Well, I apologize for missing that. I did That's read right. the report, but I did That's miss right. that. That's all right. It's confusing to present it that way. So I'm sorry yeah. for the confusion. Um, the other thing, just from a presentation point of view, this page that I'm talking about looking at, um, I'm wondering if there's a way in the future to get some subtotals in it so that just as a number sheet, for instance, we could see you know, what the subtotal of water quality improvement here is on this sheet and creek restoration and since you're presenting them in the in the presentation it would be great for us to have here to refer back to in the future no problem happy to do that i'm gonna make a note right now so don't forget <laughs> uh, on the other hand i'd also like to comment that um as usual um we run a fairly efficient division and we 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 budget what I think very um, precisely moving forward and yet year after year we do not expend a hundred percent of what we tell ourselves that we're going to spend. Um, I think that shows a great efficiency of the department. I think there are also some other reasons. Uh, for instance, we didn't have a big capital project start this year. That would be the golf course. So there could be some staff time saved on that or, or some sort of expenditures uh, saved. But, um, you know, with the low uh, level, low percentage of overhead that we have, the salaries and benefits being at 30 percent or so, that's fairly low from a citywide perspective. We do have some allocations that go out that add on top of that, but it's still low. Um, we spend an awful lot of our money actually at doing things and paying for uh, projects and research and other items that are that benefit 
the community, and I'm really proud to be a part of this uh, this division, knowing that. Thank you. Are there any comments? Any further comments, Mr. Wilson, or questions? Question for you, Mr. Benson. What are administrative citations? Do they at all relate to one full-time equivalent in enforcement? Under the city's municipal code, there are, uh, uh, the, or excuse me, the city's municipal code has ordinances to prohibit uh, contaminated discharges of water. And we receive calls from the public and uh, other agencies uh, community groups about discharges of what appears to be polluted or contaminated water. We have uh, one full-time equivalent uh, position for enforcement, for municipal code enforcement. Those people go out, they do, we split it between two staff members, uh, half time each. They go into the field, they do an investigation, and uh, the the process is when you find somebody in violation of the municipal code, the it's sort of a graduated uh, fine process. The first step in that, and this is the direction from the city council, is to treat those as opportunities for education of the public. So our staff will go out, uh, we'll, we'll do an investigation, we'll communicate with the person who, or the, the alleged violator, and uh, explain to them that what they're doing is, is violates the municipal code and is contaminating the creeks or ocean. Uh, we send, we go back to the office, we send that person a notice of violation and it opens an enforcement action to make sure that the, inf the uh, pollution is abated. And generally speaking, the person doesn't do it again. They, it was an innocent mistake. When we get called to, the, to that location a second time, the person is subject to a fine. And the first fine is $100. And so we have, uh, we have over time had more people who have had notices and have had that second visit. And so we've seen the, that number double, essentially, each year that we've been doing the enforcement program. Should any, uh, uh, any thought or direction head towards that one full-time equivalent being um, any sort of a I hesitate in using this term, but a revenue generator of sorts, or um, uh, earning their uh, earning their salary through enforcement. I put the question out there. I mean, it's I think it's worth uh, worth mentioning for public to hear as well. Mr. Benson, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the city has adopted a very um, methodical uh, procedure for the issuing of um, uh, enforcement uh, tickets. And to step up in this division would go against the, uh, the procedures that the city has set up. Is that not correct? Well, as, as I explained, uh, we, we do have that graduated enforcement process. So the the first step in in uh, the enforcement action is to educate the community uh, as to what the uh, ordinance says and what the consequences are of violating the ordinance. And um, as I said, usually that's enough for most people. So uh, the other thing is that the the, the call, number of calls we get fluctuates pretty dramatically, and we have. Uh, it seems like it, it comes in spurts where sometimes we will have two people out uh, all day. We'll have a dozen or, or more calls in uh, over, a few, over a three or four-day period. Other times we'll go three or four days without any calls. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Chair, uh, um, I want to thank you again for this excellent uh, presentation. And uh, as we head into Thanksgiving, and I prepared a move to adjourn. Uh, I think uh, the good management that uh, the Creeks program and the Parks and Rec program uh, have done are, are reflected uh, in, um, in these numbers that you're reporting for the public to see. 
So I want to thank you again for the uh, interim update. And uh, and before you say anything else, I will note for the record that there we would take public comment on this item, but I have no speaker slips for that. And I have one more comment from Mr. Schluter. I have a question to you, Mr. Chair. Is is this topic of of um, of enforcement? Can we talk about that since it's not on the agenda? Or um, were we to try to brainstorm anything about it or recommend, probably not. It isn't an issue that's on agenda for us. We can talk about it only as it relates to budget at the moment. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just going to mention that we do have, uh, we will probably have a budget subcommittee meeting in December, uh, possibly in January, but likely in December, and we'll be back to this committee uh, in the spring for a budget discussion, and, and that could be an opportunity to, to talk about a, a wide range of different items and issues. Uh, move, move to adjourn. I do have a motion to adjourn. Is there a second? And without objection, we are adjourned. And Thank happy Thanksgiving to everyone. <laughs>